Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Essex Metro Immunization Coalition meeting uh, for December 2022. And uh, as people are coming into the meeting, uh, we'll put some uh, messages in the, in the chat. I'll briefly go over the agenda for today's meeting, and then I will introduce Dr. Schwab to um, start introductions. Okay, so um, for our agenda today, um, we will start with welcome and introductions from Dr. Schwab, the uh, EMEC chair, and approve the September meeting minutes. Uh, then we will have a feature presentation from um, on RSV, the burden of infants and potential preventative strategies. We'll go through some EMIC working group updates and we'll finish with EMIC member updates. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Schwab. Okay, thank you, Emily. And um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our quarterly meeting. It's uh, nice to have you all here for the last meeting of the year. And I think it's a we have a very exciting agenda and our topic today is very timely considering what we've all been experiencing clinically uh, as well as personally over the last few months um, related to RSV. So I'm excited to have that be our topic for our meeting. Um, I thought we'd start as we traditionally do with um, some introductions. So and especially any new members that we have joining for the first time, if you would, uh, unmute and even show your video if you'd like to share with us um, and just introduce who you are, where you're from, uh, so we, we know who's joining us today. And if anyone can't do that, you can also put some uh, comments in the chat and we can announce those. Hello, I'm Joanne Walsh and I work for Securus. I'm the regional account manager and I haven't attended this coalition meeting in some time, but I'm happy to say recently my territory changed and now it's all New Jersey. That's great, welcome back. We're happy to have you. Hi, my name is Jasmine Anderson. Um, I'm from the partnership. Um, I am the uh, new um, immunizations education uh, specialist for immunization initiatives at the partnership. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Liliana Pinot. I'm the chief operating officer at the partnership. Thank you. And there's a in the chat, Candice Martin from Fetal and Infant Mortality Review Program Manager with the partnership is on the call. Hey everyone, this is Leanne Lowenthal. I'm the trainer for NJIAS with the partnership. Thanks, welcome. Hello everyone, um, this is Jennifer. I'm the health educator for the uh, Vaccine Preventable Disease Program, Department of Health. And I'm having problems opening the um, agenda. I don't know why, it's wanting me to save it instead of download it. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Esme M. Sharp and I am the vice chair of EMIC. I'm so happy to see everyone that's on the line today. Welcome, Dr. Sharp. And I see, did we announce Brian Bozeman Sims, a health educator for Union County Office of Health Management, is on the call. All right, so welcome, especially to all our new members. We're happy to have you here. And uh, we'd like you to remind you to get involved as well with our working groups, which you'll hear more about at the end of the meeting if you're not familiar with those. Um, the first order of business is to review and approve the minutes. So those were sent out to you with the materials and then Emily also posted them in the chat. So if you could take a moment to review those. Um, then we can, I'll accept a motion to approve those and accept them into the record. And we'll take a vote on that.
So if there are no additions or corrections to the minutes, do I have a motion to accept them? I make a motion to accept the meeting minutes from our last EMIC meeting. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sharp. And we have a second. Uh, well, I guess we can vote in the, you can put that into the chat if uh, you're shy, but everyone can then vote yes or no to accept the minutes into the record. them in the chat. Okay, that's great. So we can um, count those up. Uh, and if there are any late additions or corrections, please just forward them to us by email. So I guess we can move on to the presentation then. So, all right, so I'm very happy to um, welcome Helene Janoshik um, to be our speaker this morning on RSV. Um, she's been with Sanofi Vaccines for 16 years. Uh, she spent seven years as a research scientist in the immunology labs, developing assays for clinical testing, and then spent seven years as a clinical project leader, managing clinical studies from phase one to phase three, and licensure globally for several vaccines, uh, most recently for influenza and for COVID vaccines. She's now starting her journey as a medical science liaison, which entails meeting with healthcare professionals and discussing vaccine-related science, policy, and medicine. Personally, Helene is a mom of three and enjoys being busy attending social and sports events with the kids and visiting her large extended family. And so we're very happy to welcome Helene here for this talk. And I'm sure uh, we'll all be uh, getting some useful information from her. The title is Respiratory Syncytial Virus, Burden of Disease in All Infants, and potential preventive strategies. So I'll turn the meeting over to Helene, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwab. Um, hello everybody, I'm Helene Janoshik. I'm a medical science liaison with Sanofi Vaccines. So as a medical science liaison, my role directly supports the medical department within Sanofi. It is not commercial or sales. And it is really a pleasure for me to be here today and talk to some vaccine champions in the New Jersey area. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you, as Dr. Schwab mentioned, uh, about RSV, burden of disease, in the infant population, as well as some potential preventative strategies. But before we get into the presentation, I thought we could look at what's going on in the U.S. right now with RSV. So on my screen, you'll see some data from the CDC, and this is data from their um, NREV. Uh, database, so that's the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System. And this data is collected from participating labs around the country in each state. And they are voluntarily providing information to the CDC on RSV confirmed cases in their state on a routine basis. And because this data is provided on a routine basis, it can change, especially um, the data that's most recently provided. So for example, the data in the last two weeks might not be as accurate as the data that was submitted months ago. Um, and we know for RSV that testing is not required for a diagnosis, so it is possible that this data is also underrepresenting the burden of disease of RSV in the U.S. 
So first we're gonna look at what's going on nationally. And you can see um, the graph to the right, we're gonna focus on that graph. And this graph is showing you the number of RSV detections via an antigen test or a PCR test. And I wanna point out an important difference here. So the antigen testing is shown in the blue line, but you can see on the y-axis that the scale for antigen detections is small compared to the scale for PCR detection. And that's because the PCR method is used more often to detect RSV. So it can be helpful to just focus on that PCR line in purple to get an idea of what's going on in the US now. So what do we see nationally? You can see um, to the left, season 2021. And if we look at that purple line, RSV was circulating out of season. So a lot of RSV was circulating over the summer months and it seems that it peaked pretty early. And now if we look to the right of the graph in 2022, RSV is circulating more seasonally, but the level of RSV is greatly increased over the level you see with the purple line in 2021. So this is a significant increase in RSV cases nationally. And this is occurring in other data sets. So this graph to the right is the data set for the Northeast region of which New Jersey is a part of. And you can see that same trend when you look at the purple PCR line, there's a significant increase in cases. And you're gonna see it in New Jersey specifically as well. So a similar pattern, and this is the graph to the right on the screen now, a significant increase in cases of RSV in New Jersey specifically. So we looked at the rate of RSV cases, but let's look at one of the more severe outcomes, RSV hospitalization. So again, we're gonna rely on the data from the CDC, and this data is going to come from RSV net. So this is a surveillance system used to um, track RSV confirmed hospitalizations. And again, this is voluntary and it's coming from participating labs across the US. However, there are far fewer participating labs for the RSV hospitalization tracking. So that's important to keep in mind when looking at the data set. So what you can see on the screen here is several RSV seasons. And the current season is the outlier. It's shown in the light green line. And what do we see? We see a sharp increase in RSV confirmed hospitalization compared to the 2018-2019 season in orange, to the 2019-2020 season in purple, an increase compared to the 2020-2021 season in blue, and similarly, an increase compared to last season 2021, 2022 in the dark green. So um, significant burden of disease in terms of hospitalizations uh, compared to previous years. And what age group is being impacted the most? So we can look at that in this same database. And so for the current season shown here, the different ages are shown in different colored lines. And the age that is most significantly impacted by RSV hospitalizations are the young children. So zero to four years shown in the blue line. So that's what's going on in the US right now. You're all very aware of this because it's all over the news and it's really impacting our public health systems. So now we're gonna dive into the presentation and we're gonna talk about what is the situation with RSV overall and about some possible preventative strategies that we may be able to use in the future to address this disease with a significant uh, burden associated with it. So first let's talk about the virus. So RSV is a single stranded, negative sense, non-segmented RNA virus. And this virus is part of the pneumovirus family. So a cousin, if you will, to HMPV, human metanumavirus. So they have genetic similarities. And there are two major subtypes for RSV. So there's RSV A and RSV B that are commonly circulating. And there are two surface glycoproteins that are important when developing a prophylactic strategy. 
And those proteins are the G protein and the F protein. So the G protein and the F protein are shown in blue and red rods respectively on the pictogram to the left. The G protein or the glycoprotein functions to attach the RSV virus to the host cell in the respiratory epithelium. And this, this protein is very variable. And because of that variation, this protein determines whether the RSV virus is RSV type A or RSV type B. And then there's the fusion protein or the F protein. And this functions to allow fusion between the host cell membrane and the viral cell membrane. So this allows the virus to enter the host cell and cause infection. And this protein is better conserved with a lot less variability than the G protein. And because it's conserved, it becomes an ideal target for vaccines or monoclonal antibodies. Because if you're targeting something that's conserved across all of the different types of viruses that might be circulating, you have the opportunity to potentially protect against all those different types. So let's zoom in a bit on that F protein, which we said was a great target for monoclonal antibodies and vaccines. So on this slide, you can see a picture of the F protein. Again, it's highly conserved. So it has greater than 90% conservation in the regions that contact the host cell. So it's a good target. And this protein exists in two shapes, the pre-F conformation and the post-F conformation seen here. And what do we notice about these two shapes of the protein? Well, first you'll notice a difference in the number of sites that are available on each protein for an antibody to um, target. And then you'll see that there's a difference in the location of the sites and the accessibility of the sites. So for example, site zero at the top of the pre-F conformation seems to be very big and possibly accessible by multiple angles and orientations. So an antibody might have a better chance of getting to that site on this protein versus another site. And then you'll notice in that little graph to the bottom that each site has a difference in neutralization sensitivity. So when the antibody targets site one, it is less neutralizing to the virus than if an antibody targets site zero, which is highly neutralizing to the RSV virus. So all of these aspects, the shape of the protein, the sites that are targeted on the protein and the neutralization sensitivity of those sites are very important to consider when you try to develop a prophylactic strategy. So we talked about the virus. Now let's shift and start talking about the seasonality of this disease. So globally, the RSV season differs in location, length, peak, and intensity. And even within the US, there are differences between the northern states and the southern states. And you can see some of those differences on this graph. So the lines represent the differences in the durations of the RSV season in each region in the US and then by year. And the dots represent the differences in the peaks of each season in each region and in each year. So you can see this moving around, there's a lot of variability. And this shifting in the seasons also shifts the timing that the population would require protection from RSV. And so this is a challenge when trying to develop something to protect the population. So we're looking at disease seasonality in a bit more detail on this slide. Um, each region in the US is assigned an HHS number. And um, this is the Health and Human Services number. And what you can see on the graph to the left are different colors. And these different colors represent differences in the RSV season start, duration, peak, and end in each of these regions. So there's a lot of color, which means there's a lot of variability in the US. And then in the graph to the right, this is intended to show the difference in the magnitude of cases per region. So how many cases are occurring in each of these regions. And again, you can see differences with some cases, some regions experiencing less cases than other regions. And not only do these seasons vary, but RSV is also a very difficult uh, disease to track because it's not a nationally notifiable disease. There is no testing required. And the surveillance that we just reviewed for the CDC is optional. So the seasons are shifting, the tracking is suboptimal, again, adding to the challenge of addressing this disease. 
So how is RSV impacting the population? So this is an infection that occurs throughout a lifetime. The natural immunity from a natural infection is not enough to protect the population long-term. So reinfection occurs throughout a lifetime. Now, the populations that are um, at most at risk for severe disease are the bookends, the newborns and the older adults with the newborns often experiencing lower respiratory tract infections and older adults having exacerbation of underlying conditions like asthma and COPD. And then the symptoms of RSV are also variable and make addressing this disease difficult because you can have mild symptoms such as a cough or a sneeze, or you can have severe symptoms like difficulty breathing. And you can progress from mild disease to severe disease very rapidly, and it's unpredictable if that will occur. And then there are a lot of non-respiratory symptoms that overlap both mild and severe cases, making them hard to differentiate. And these sim symptoms, you'll notice, also um, are similar to the symptoms for other respiratory diseases. So again, difficult to differentiate this from other diseases. And because of all all of that in the infant population, it is difficult to predict which infants will have severe disease. So in terms of severe disease, let's look at one of the more severe outcomes in the infant population, and that would be a hospitalization due to RSV. So this slide is supported by a study done by Leader et al. And in this study, they attempted to identify the leading cause of hospitalization in the infant population in the US, so less than one year of age. And what they found over this four year period is that for the infants that required hospitalization, 33% or 331,000 were hospitalized due to bronchiolitis due to RSV. And the next two primary diagnoses were bronchiolitis unspecified and pneumonia unspecified. And what do we know about these diagnoses? Well, they present clinically very similar to RSV and there is no testing required for RSV. So it is possible that a proportion of those cases are actually attributable, attributable to RSV and the burden can be underrepresented. So not only is hospitalization a significant burden of disease in this population, but it might be underrepresented. So let's look at the um, hospitalization burden data in a broader time period. So this study reviews um, that burden of disease over 11 seasons. And what they found was that acute bronchiolitis due to RSV was the leading cause of infant hospitalization across all 11 years. So not only is it a significant burden of disease, but it's consistently a significant burden of disease in the infant population. And beyond hospitalization, there are other morbidities that can be associated with RSV. So in the short term, RSV is associated with increased ear infections, pneumonia, and excessive antibiotic use. And this can contribute to the issue of antimicrobial resistance that we experience in the US today. And in the long term, RSV might be associated with recurrent wheezing, reduced pulmonary function, or increased healthcare utilization. And then there are other less measured impacts, like, for example, caregiver loss of work or the emotional impact for a family that has a baby in the hospital due to RSV. And if we expand our view broader and we don't just look at hospitalizations, but we want to look at the burden of disease across all healthcare settings, we can refer to this slide. So this slide is supported by a study done by the CDC, Raina et al., as well as studies done by Hall and Lively et al. And what they found was that RSV is a consistent burden of disease throughout that entire first year of life, regardless of month of age. Most of the hospitalizations shown in the black bars are happening in the first few months but the emergency department visits in purple and the outpatient visits in green are consistent throughout that entire first year, and they represent 17 times the burden of hospitalization. So this means our doctors, our healthcare providers are very busy addressing RSV in the infant population. And if we want to look at that burden in terms of number of cases, we can refer to this slide. So it's estimated that annually within the U.S., 
infants are experiencing about 400,000 outpatient visits, 147,000 emergency department visits, 33,000 hospitalizations, and about 100 deaths. And that's just in the US. So if we look at this globally, of course, it will increase significantly with approximately 12 million cases of RSV, leading to 2 million hospitalizations and 43,000 deaths. So the take home message of this side really is that RSV is a significant burden of disease, but that 97% of that burden is in the outpatient setting. So at outpatient visits or emergency department visits. So if you wanna have a real impact on this disease, you can't just focus on preventing hospitalizations. You need to do something about the outpatient burden as well. And one of the reasons that the burden of disease is so high is because RSV is very contagious, it's very transmissible. Um, it's transmitted by respiratory droplets or by contact with contaminated surfaces. It has a mean R0 of 4.5, and this means that for every infectious person, they could potentially infect four or more additional people. And just to put that in context, influenza, depending on the season, has a mean R0 between 1.7 and 2. And so because it's so contagious, um, the WHO actually estimates that greater than 60% of acute respiratory infections in infants and young children worldwide are due to RSV. So it's by far the most common etiology of these respiratory infections with other more commonly known pathogens like influenza and strep only contributing to less than 10% of these respiratory infections in the infant and young child population worldwide. So with such a majority, when we're discussing respiratory viruses in the infant population, it's very important to include RSV in that discussion. And because it's so infectious, it leads to a majority of the infant population being infected. So um, there are studies that support that two out of every three infants are infected with RSV by the time they're 12 months of age, and that 97% of children are infected with RSV by the time they're two years old. So when almost everybody's infected, it becomes very difficult to predict which of these infants will have the most severe outcomes like hospitalization. So if we try and answer that question, we can look at this study. It was done by Areola et al. And in this study, they attempted to identify the population of infants that are hospitalized with RSV. So what infants are having that severe outcome of hospitalization? And what they found was that 72% of infants hospitalized with RSV are otherwise healthy term babies. So these babies have no health anomalies, no risk factors, they are not preterm, and they have no underlying conditions. So this is really fundamental to the challenge of addressing RSV because the practitioner, the parent, they couldn't have guessed that that child once infected would end up in the hospital. And it makes sense if you think about it because only 10% of the birth cohort are infants who are preterm or who have underlying conditions. So even though they're at higher risk of severe disease, it's a small population. 90% of the birth cohort are healthy term babies. So even if they have a lower risk of severe disease, that lower risk applied to a very large population means that the majority of infants who carry the most burden of disease are healthy babies. And so this data suggests that all infants require protection from RSV. And this continues for the more serious interventions. So for the infants hospitalized that then move on to require ICU admission or mechanical ventilation, the majority of those infants are healthy term babies. And it continues regardless of insurance. So regardless of if, if an infant is commercially insured or Medicaid insured, the majority of infants who are hospitalized are healthy term babies. And that means that this population is really driving the cost of RSV hospitalization for these insurances. And what's also seen in the data, but not shown on this slide, is that Medicaid infants are experiencing RSV hospitalizations at about two times the rate of commercially insured infants. So this suggests that when a prophylactic strategy is developed, equity of access needs to be addressed to ensure that one population 
doesn't uh, become disproportionately impacted by this disease. So now let's look at RSV compared to a more commonly known respiratory virus. So we'll look at RSV burden of disease versus influenza. And this slide is supported by three studies. Each study looked at a different outcome. And what they found was that RSV is causing 10 times greater death than influenza, 16 times more hospitalizations, and five times more medically attended events. And there's also another very important difference between these two viruses from a public health perspective. And that is that there is a vaccine currently available, routinely recommended and administered to the entire population six months of age and older, but there is no similar prophylactic available for RSV, even though the burden is so much greater. So now when an infant is infected with RSV and ends up in the hospital, the only option for the provider and for the parents is supportive care. So IV fluids, supplemental oxygen, and potentially mechanical ventilation. So we just talked a whole bunch about the burden of disease. And I think we've established that the burden of RSV in the infant population is significant. So what can we do? Let's talk about some approaches to RSV pre prevention in the entire infant population. So on this slide, you'll see three potential approaches for prevention of RSV. And those approaches include a long-acting monoclonal antibody, maternal immunization, or infant immunization. And each of these strategies has pros and cons, and we'll discuss them. So, for a long-acting monoclonal antibody, some of the pros, this is a passive immunization. So you're providing preformed antibody directly to that baby. The infant does not need to mount an immune response and therefore there can be rapid protection after dosing. These antibodies can be engineered to provide season long protection for the typical five month season. This previously wasn't possible. And, um, so those are some of the pros, but some of the cons to this approach are for, for certain, um, it's only going to protect for a single season. And if the season is very long, much longer than five months, you could need potentially multiple doses. And then there's potential for viral escape by loss of an epitope. So if that RSV virus mutates and that site that the antibody's targeting changes, then that antibody can be less effective at neutralizing the virus. And there's a potential for anti-drug antibodies. So these are antibodies produced by the immune system in response to a therapeutic, and that can impact the pharmacokinetics of the therapeutic. So how long is it retained in the body to protect the individual, as well as potentially safety. So that would need to be monitored. And now let's shift to maternal immunization. So some of the pros of this approach, again, this is passive immunization. So mom's getting the vaccine, mom is producing the antibodies and she's transferring those antibodies to baby. You don't need the baby to have an immune response. Another pro is that this has really been a success story for influenza and pertussis. But some of the cons to this approach are mainly that it heavily relies on the gestational age of the baby at the time of vaccination and for a seasonal disease on the birth month. So for example, if mom is vaccinated and a uh, baby is born premature, then the, all of the antibodies from mom may not have passed to that child, leaving that premature infant who's at high risk of severe disease at risk. Um, and protection may not last for an entire season because maternal antibodies can wane. So for babies who are born in season, they might have some protection, but for babies born out of season, the antibodies might wane before season start and those babies can be left unprotected. And then finally, suboptimal access. So we can think about the COVID-19 pandemic and pregnant women were not very supportive of being vaccinated. So if they're not getting vaccinated, it will certainly limit the ability of this strategy to protect the population. And then finally, we'll look at infant immunization. So some of the pros to this approach are, of course, that number one, it's acceptable to stakeholders. So there are a lot of infant vaccines that are routinely administered. And there's a potential with this approach for multi-season protection. And we said that was a con for the long-acting monoclonal antibody. 
But some of the cons to this approach are that multiple doses are often needed for an infant to mount an appropriate immune response to be protected. So for example, vaccinating a baby at two, four, and six months. And that means that that baby is not fully protected until six months, leaving that younger population who's at high risk for severe disease unprotected. And historically, premature infants have a difficult time mounting a good immune response to a vaccination. So those babies can also be left as protected. So now we're gonna look at a few studies that compare and contrast these different approaches. So the first study we're, we're going to review is a study done by Janet et al. And this is a modeling study. And this compares maternal immunization to the long acting monoclonal antibody. So for the maternal immunization, they assume either two to four months of protection shown in light and dark green respectively. And for the long acting monoclonal antibody, they assume a single dose provides five months of protection. And this is based off of data and literature. And that's shown in purple, the monoclonal antibody. So the results are shown on this graph. On the graph, you can see the birth month on the, of the baby on the left, and then the typical RSV season in the US at the top, so between November and March. And what you can see is that for the maternal immunization, some babies born in season can get protection. However, for babies born out of season, those antibodies would have waned by the time the season starts, leaving those babies unprotected. The only approach that protected all of the babies for the entire season is the long-acting monoclonal antibody administered right before season start. But there are some assumptions that can impact this model. First of all, the seasonal pattern of RSV. We've seen some crazy RSV seasons recently. So if the antibody is not provided at the right time, it can impact, impact the ability of that antibody to protect the population. And also um, the effectiveness of each product. So for example, if one product is 50% effective versus 80% effective for another strategy, that was not considered in this model. Um, so that could impact these results and uptake. So if mom doesn't wanna get vaccinated, or parents don't wanna provide a monoclonal antibody to their babies, then it's going to impact the ability to protect the population. Now for vaccines, we know how to administer them, um, but for a monoclonal antibody provided to an entire infant population, this would need to be assessed. So one proposal is shown on this slide, and you can see for infants born in season, in the um, dark orange box, the proposal would be to provide that monoclonal antibody at birth, so in the hospital, similar to the Hep B vaccination. And then for babies born out of season, you could potentially provide the monoclonal antibody at one of the already established well child visits uh, right before season starts. So for example, babies born in October would receive their monoclonal antibody at the one month visit. And for babies born in August and September, they would receive the monoclonal antibody at their two month visit, for example. Or you could potentially have a clinic shown in the dotted orange box. Another study comparing these two approaches was done by the CDC. Um, in this study, they compared maternal immunization to the long-acting monoclonal antibody, but they assumed the same efficacy for each product and a higher uptake and longer duration of protection for the long-acting monoclonal antibody. And again, this is a modeling study because there are no products currently available. And the results of this modeling study are shown here. So for each healthcare setting, the number of visits that you might expect without any preventative strategy are shown in the white bars. So you know that slide we reviewed many slides ago um, with approximately 400,000 outpatient visits every year. That's why you can see that white bar up around 400,000 cases with no preventative strategy. So what they found was that for the current standard of care, which is a monoclonal antibody provided to a very limited population of infants, there are very few cases being prevented shown in the green bar. And that's probably because not a lot of infants are receiving this. And then for the antibody candidate, you can see compared to the maternal vaccine, this candidate is preventing approximately three and a half times the number of outpatient visits and ED visits as the maternal candidate is. Again, shown in the green bar, visits prevented. 
And then finally, for hospitalizations, the antibody candidate was found to prevent approximately two times the hospitalizations than the maternal candidate. And that's it. So that um, concludes the information I wanted to share on burden of disease um, and the potential preventative strategies. So now I'm happy to open it up to questions or even discussion if we want to share our thoughts on the burden or these preventative strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. That was wonderful. Just uh, I think uh, maybe we're all becoming mini epidemiologists with that very clear explanation of the burden of disease and then the ways to prevent it. So thank you very much. Um, sure. I think uh, there were a couple of questions that started in the chat. Um, so there was a question from Iris Novus Cooney. Does this double immunization approach include immuniz immunizing postpartum for lactating individuals if the expecting individual was not vaccinated during the gestational period? So I assume um, this is suggesting that if a mother would be vaccinated postpartum that she might pass on antibodies through breast milk. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the benefit of doing that would have to be evaluated in clinical studies to support a recommendation like that. Currently, um, there are maternal immunizations in development, uh, mainly focused on uh, vaccinating mom during pregnancy before a baby is born uh, to be determined if there's anything additional being assessed in those studies to support postpartum vaccination. You have any other questions? Yeah, so um, Emily, so uh, the slide I reviewed between 2009 and 2019, so 11 seasons, showed that RSV was the leading cause of hospitalization in the infant population. And at the beginning of the presentation, we reviewed what's going on with RSV right now. And uh, one of the seasons that we compared this current season to was 2018-2019. So if RSV was the leading cause of infant hospitalization in 2018, 2019, and this season is causing significantly more infant hospitalizations, I would expect it to remain a very high burden of disease um, in this season um, when compared to other reasons for infant hospitalization, if that makes sense. Thank you, Helene. And Dr. Schwab, as a pediatrician, what do you have any insights you could share for um, parents that are concerned about RSV or you know they're hearing about RSV spreading this year on the news and the triple demic? You know, what how do you counsel parents to know what RSV is and you know what they should kind of be aware of for um, you know bringing their child in for a visit or something like that? Yeah, so thank you, Emily. We, we have had a lot of questions from families about it, I think because they're more aware of the, the virus because it's in the news so much. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I emphasize with my families is the how contagious a virus it is. And Eileen showed the slide showing how many people can be infected by one index case. And so, you know, we know that it's very contagious. So trying to convince people that um, basic preventive measures like not going out and not bringing small babies out when there are sick individuals around, especially this time of year, taking some routine hygiene is important. And masks, actually, although we've gotten away from mask use um, until we have some kind of prophylactic treatment, either a vaccine or a monoclonal antibody, then limiting exposure and using masks can be very helpful. And so even if we're considering COVID is getting behind us, although it's not really, um, RSV is a very good example of why those kinds of measures might be still useful 
um, especially in certain circumstances like uh, smaller babies, premature babies, and uh, families with older individuals as well. Hi, Hi this is Jennifer. Um, I was just wondering, what do you say um, to um, um, those who question the data or those who say, um, well, the only reason why RSV is high now is because we were masking, um, you know, due to COVID and our, you know, our immune system wasn't, you know, fighting as much as it usually is because of all the masking. And that's why RSV cases are so high, which I'm guessing, you know, plays into it, but is not the whole picture. So how would you address those cynics, should I say, um, who don't think it's, um, you know, as major of an issue as it is, they're just kind of attributing it to um, the extensive masking and social distancing during the earlier stages of the pandemic. So I, I could take a stab at this first. I think, um, you know, you can, use some of the data that we discussed today, that's all data um, pre-pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, RSV was still a significant burden of disease in the um, population overall and in the populations that are most at risk for severe disease, like infants and older adults. It was the leading cause of hospitalizations before the pandemic. Um, so, regardless of what's happening now, um, if you think about it holistically, this disease is still important um, to address and it's important to take precautions to prevent um, those severe outcomes. And Dr. Schwab, I, I'd love for you to add anything else. Yeah, from a, from, so from a practical point of view and how we kind of counsel families, because um, I think that's really where the different the changes are going to be made as families accepting um, our explanations and also the therapies that we offer. So I think first we we need to acknowledge that that difference that we're seeing this year is real. There, there are more cases, hospitals are fuller, fuller, kids are more sick, and it probably is due to the fact that we were isolated and masked for the last two years, and so there was kind of a general lack of any kind of immunity in a large part of our population and waning immunity even in the adults and older kids. And so to, to acknowledge that that's real, but then point out the data that you uh, showed in your slides about the burden of RSV disease, even in the years prior to COVID, um, kind of acknowledges a person's perceptions of what's going on and tries to give an explanation that's understandable, that it, it doesn't mean that it was not a problem before and, and it's just a kind of a made up problem now, but that it's a compounded problem now based on something that was already present. And even if they didn't personally experience it or um, were kind of exposed to it in the same way we are now, um, doesn't mean that it didn't exist. So I think acknowledging a person's concerns and not kind of making light of the reality that they're seeing and perceiving and then trying to give a, a rational explanation for it. it goes a long way to getting people on board with understanding and willing to maybe move towards the next step which is accepting a therapy that we think might be helpful i think that's great i think that's a great um both great answers but yeah the whole acknowledgement is plays a big role and i um just wanted to say um helene um i really appreciate how you delivered your presentation you explained the slides very thoroughly for a non epidemiological uh, epidemiologist to um understand in the audience so good job on that thank you very much much appreciated Candace? Yeah, okay. Um, so she asked, in regard to the disparity in the rate of RSV between commercial and Medicaid um, insured infants, um, does the study offer or uh, kind of imply any kind of rationale to explain that? Yeah, so I guess the rationale could be 
that um, commercially insured infants might have more access to um, covered outpatient care where Medicaid insured infants might be going directly to the emergency department um, and you know, faster to that hospital um, visit. And um, additionally, just the behaviors in, in different populations in terms of their um, abilities to get the help they need um, in, a, in a timely manner. Thanks. Um, I had a question, uh, and this is kind of from your experience as a scientist. Uh, if we use something like a monoclonal antibody in that first season, um, what do you think the potential is that then the second season might be more severe for those individual patients who didn't have an opportunity to develop any resist and any um, immunity? Mm -hmm. And would we then be setting up the older infants for what's happening this year because they weren't exposed because of masks, now they may not be exposed because of the antibodies kind of sure. infection sure. damage. That's a great question and an important discussion. So I think there's two prompts to that. First of all, um, just acknowledging that the infants, the young infants um, is at higher risk than maybe an older child. So preventing disease in that population still becomes important even if it were just to push disease off into an older year because it's likely gonna be less severe in that older year. But also um, a monoclonal antibody is providing circulating antibody to neutralize the virus. It's not providing mucosal immunity and um, mucosal immunity would really be required to prevent any infection from occurring. So um, to prevent an upper respiratory tract infection, for example. So those infants could still potentially be infected with RSV naturally, getting some kind of immune boost from a natural infection, but um, the monoclonal antibody would serve to protect from more severe lower respiratory tract infections because of that circulating antibody, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. Okay. The slides that you shared where, you know, two out of three infants are infected with RSV by the age of one and essentially all uh, children are uh, infected by the age of two. Um, is it, but we, we tend to kind of say the higher risk population is the under, under two, under five, um, you know, smaller children and then the elderly. So is it always that the first um, infection for the child is the most severe or could, you know, is it that if a baby, let's say a nine month old is infected um, and gets through the infection okay and then is infected the next year when they're in a group childcare setting, um, gets RSV again, um, you know, are they at risk for severe outcomes as well? Or since they've already had it and built some immunity, or do they have a less severe risk? Because I, I hear parents sometimes say, oh, my baby already had RSV, so I don't have to worry about it this year, even though they're still a young child. Yeah. And I know with flu, we don't, that's not the case. So is that how, is that the case with RSV or is it different? Yeah, I think it's really hard to predict when um, someone who's infected is going to have severe disease or not. It's really an individual um, situation. We know that the natural infection is not providing lifelong immunity. So those reinfections will occur and um, you know, severity of that disease really depends on that particular individual. Infants we say are um, most often at more are increased risk because of some of the um, characteristics of infants in general. So infants in general don't have, you know, a very robust immune system able to fight off disease as well as maybe an adult. Um, also, infants could have, you know, smaller airways, um, potentially underdeveloped lungs. So when you have a respiratory virus, those things are, are not helpful. You could have more severe disease. 
and they're obligate nasal breathers. So if they're gonna get all stuffed up, it's gonna become really difficult for them to breathe um, with a respiratory virus and that's not going to occur in, in the older population. And then the older adults, right? They've, they've gotten all of these underlying conditions from a lifetime and now those underlying conditions can be exacerbated if they're infected with a respiratory disease and they have immunosenescence. So their immune system is aging, potentially not responding to um, viruses as well as the younger adult population and not providing them as much protection. So um, that's why we say those two groups are at more, more increased risk just because of their general characteristics, but it doesn't mean anybody can't have a severe disease based on their individual situation. Dr. Schwab, I'll, I'll pass it to you. I think that's very true. And I think in a lot of respiratory diseases, that's it's some of it are the mechanical factors that you mentioned, like the size of the airways, um, as well as the immune response. I guess the other thing that I would wonder about, and maybe, maybe you can answer this, is you mentioned RSV does, um, there are changes in the epitopes in terms of what, uh, like the strain of RSV, like we think of with flu from season to season. And so I think the the immunity from one season may not carry over necessarily to the next kind of RSV that's circulating if it's different enough, even so that coupled with some waning immunity might be part of it. Another comment from Iris, um, comorbidities certainly make the geriatric population more vulnerable as well. So yeah, those, those um, factors that change how a person responds to disease in general are going to play into RSV infection. And now that we're, we've experienced this kind of unprecedented peak, you know, this fall with RSV and typically we, we also see RSV infections in the spring also, right? or like later winter, do you, do you think that we'll have less infections at that point because we're experiencing this now and maybe a less severe season next year or any predictions with a crystal ball on that from anyone? <laughs> I think I would avoid predictions as, <laughs> as much as possible. Um, I know a lot of people are really surprised with the out of season circulation that occurred um, after the lockdown with COVID and these increased rates. And I am not an epidemiologist, but I certainly speak to some, and um, this is not a prediction, but just to say epidemiologists um, are, you know, discussing that this was a seasonal disease um, for decades. And, COVID disrupted the season, but hopefully because of that decades of history, this will return to a, a seasonal disease that we can better predict with all the caveats attached to it. <laughs> that, that makes the most sense, doesn't it? That it's gonna go back to what it was if, if conditions go back to what they were or close to it. Um, and I guess it also depends, Emily, your question on um, how much back to normal we get will determine how long this takes to peak and go away and whether there's a second peak if because uh, it's contagious. So it depends not just on the the virus, but it also depends on how people interact and when transmission might occur. Do you have any more questions? Mm -hmm. Candace asks, are we seeing more strains emerging? Is it usually a typical one strain affecting the whole country or one or two for the season or are there pockets and how does that work? Yeah, I think that's difficult to answer because uh, the tracking being suboptimal for RSV. So um, it's not like 
um, some of the other nationally notifiable diseases where you're tracking it very closely, you're sequencing um, everything that comes through the lab to really identify what's circulating. So I think it's difficult to answer because of the way we're tracking it. Um, there are several you know, genotypes of RSV that could circulate, um, but this virus, like if we want to talk about it very generally compared to flu, um, the mutation rate is not you know, as high as influenza, for example, where it would uh, be changing more often. Um, uh, RSV is, is, has a less mutation rate. And I will mention RSV is a non-segmented virus where influenza is a segmented virus. So um, because influenza has segments, those segments from all the different types can recombine and form a new virus that maybe the population has not seen before that could cause like a pandemic, um, but RSV is non-segmented. So it doesn't have the opportunity to switch segments between types. It would be more mutations just within that single virus that would be impacting what's circulating and it's mutating at a lower rate. Thank you. Um... I don't see any new questions in the chat. Does anyone else have any last questions for Helene? If not, I'd like to thank you. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. A lot of good information that's very timely and uh, echoed the compliments on how well it was presented. So thank you for joining us today. We look forward thank to you all for having me. And I'm happy to come again sometime and chat. In the meantime, all the best for the holiday season um, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you. So now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Emily. Uh, the next item is the working group updates. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. Um, hi, everyone. For anyone who joined us, um, you know, for after the introductions. Uh, my name is Emily Haynes, and I'm the Director of Public Health Initiatives at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, and I oversee our immunization initiatives. So I'm happy to share um, some updates from the EMIC working groups um, and what we've been up to since the last September meeting. So the Community Engagement Working Group partnered with the Unity Family Success Center in Irvington to host a trunk or treat event on Saturday, October 22nd. So these are just a few pictures of um, that event. We had a, a nice day for it. The Irvington Fire Department came out as well as other vendors. Um, we did have, uh, we collaborated with Walgreens Pharmacy to provide flu shots on site um, at the event. And families came to enjoy some trick-or-treating and they received information from various programs and partners, including Amerigroup, NJ SNAP, Essex Passaic Wellness Coalition, the Newark Community Health Centers, the New Jersey Department of Health, um, partnership programs, including childhood lead poisoning prevention, Fellows Dad Initiative, uh, Teen Outreach Program, Healthy Families, HPV and Cancer Prevention Initiative, Emotional Wellbeing Program, and the Prematurity Prevention Initiative, as well as many others. So um, within EMIC, we do have initiatives that can partner with community events to administer flu or COVID vaccines at your events. Um, as you are uh, you know, planning those this fall um, and winter now, uh, we encourage you to, to reach out to us um, to, to coordinate those events, and we would be happy to try to set up um, a partner organization with you so that you could offer flu or COVID vaccines or COVID boosters um, at the community event that you're hosting as well. And that just helps to increase access for community members to receiving vaccines. At, they're already there at the event and they can get a flu shot or a COVID shot um, on site. And that helps to make it a little bit easier for the families to get vaccinated. So if you are having events coming up in the next few months and you're interested in you know, partnering with us, um, please reach out and we're happy to collaborate and try to set that up with you. 
We also have um, the community education working group and just some um, updates to share from there. For the Power to Protect NJ flu campaign, this is a joint uh, campaign and collaboration with the New Jersey Department of Health Vaccine Preventable Disease Program. We do have new shareables available for messages, uh, messaging on social media, on your websites, um, you know, through patient um, communications and newsletters. So those are all available. They, they are available in five different languages on the Power to Protect NJ website. Um, it's powertoprotectnj.org. And uh, we also have some new videos posted. So we just had a, a really great webinar on this past Monday with Dr. David Senemo from the Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. And he did present on flu updates of what's current, currently happening with flu. We know flu activity is extremely high um, throughout the state of New Jersey right now. We're seeing a lot of flu activity and um, you know, flu vaccine rates are not where they need to be. So um, it is not too late to encourage flu vaccination for your patients. And if you need help in doing that, you can use um, the toolkit. We do have a letter from the healthcare, um, the health commissioner from New Jersey Department of Health, um, you know, endorsing the, the campaign and the toolkit and encouraging uh, people to use the toolkit to promote flu vaccine awareness. Um, we also, um, if you missed Dr. Senemo's presentation on Monday, we, it is recorded and it's on both the Power to Protect website and the um, Partnerships YouTube website as well, if you want to watch that. And I'll be sending it out in the EMIC newsletter next week also. Um, we also want to encourage the bivalent boosters, especially for those 65 and older and for pregnant women. We're seeing in the data that pregnant women are um, under uh, immunized for COVID-19. And so trying to um, share that messaging. And for those that are looking for resources, we do have a lot of um, informational videos in different languages uh, for maternal immunization on the um, partnerships website under the maternal immunizations page. There are videos, um, there are interviews, there are town halls on COVID vaccination and pregnancy to um, provide information on getting vaccinated during pregnancy and the safety profile for COVID-19 vaccine um, during pregnancy, that it is encouraged um, and that there are severe risks for pregnant um, people if they are infected with COVID-19 during pregnancy. Um, the working group also discussed ways that we can help to increase routine immunization coverage rates since that has not recovered from the pandemic. Um, we do want to encourage um, clinics and pediatric providers, um, especially for those that are providing via vaccines for children program uh, vaccines to um, talk with patients, making sure they are covered at well ahead of well visit appointments so that they're not um, coming to you know, the appointment and realizing that their coverage has lapsed and creating some you know, confusion or possible delays for the family um, or you know, a vaccines for children site, um, making sure that they are you know, communicating with the families on what to expect when they come for an appointment. Um, they can also use the reminder recall function in NGIS to help families identify any missed doses and help to get their child onto a catch-up schedule for vaccines. And um, lastly, we are continuing the Andre's Armor Book Initiative. Um, we are going to be partnering with early childhood centers in the Essex metro area to um, to actually provide the book and to conduct parent workshops for parents with children ages zero to eight. Um, the goal of this is to help to improve vaccine confidence for parents and to help give them language for talking about vaccines with their child. And then also to help children have a better understanding of what, what vaccines are and why we receive vaccines to help um, keep us healthy. So uh, we also have the book available in Spanish and Jasmine Anderson, who introduced herself earlier as the immunization education specialist. Um, she is uh, in process of 
reaching out and coordinating these events at early childhood centers. So if you happen to work with an early childhood center and you are interested in hosting a parent workshop, you can reach out to Jasmine. Her um, email is on the screen. And that's all I have for updates. Thank you, Emily. That's great. There's a lot of good work going on. Um, before we move on, does anyone have any questions for Emily related to either of the uh, working groups? And I'd always, as I always do, encourage you if you're interested in becoming more involved with the coalition, uh, joining one of the working groups. Um, they meet, we meet um, also on Zoom, so it's no traveling and uh, you can um, get more experience and have more input into the workings of our coalition. So at this point, I'll turn the meeting over now to Dr. Esme Sharp, who is our vice chair, and to conduct the member updates section of the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Swab, and thank you to our presenter today. It was outstanding, very, very informational. We appreciate that wonderful, outstanding presentation. Thank you, Emily. Um, and to all of our members, um, we would like to thank you so very much for your um, commitment to EMIC and sharing EMIC to uh, your partners and the community in the the work that you do in the community. So at this time, does any of our members have any updates or any events or anything that you would like to share with the group today? If you do, please just, I guess you could turn off, turn on your mic and just share with us what you're doing from your agency um, or what your plans are or any upcoming events. Or if you are, Hi, sir. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to share um, and I'll uh, send the flyer to Emily in just a moment. Um, I was just going to share that we have a professional development webinar coming up tomorrow, um, Thursday, December 15th at 12. Um, and I'll put the registration link in the chat. It's a part of our femur HIV program. Um, and it's going to be a um, webinar titled Acid-Based Research in Black Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health. So we'll be talking about racial inequities and um, sexual and reproductive health. And it's particularly relevant and important right now with the uh, rise in syphilis that we are currently experiencing in the country. Um, so I'll include that information also in the chat and I'll send the flyer over to Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, hi, my name is Bram Bolesman Sims. I'm the health educator at Union County Office of Health Management. And um, we've actually been collaborating with um, the partnership a lot, especially with um, Melissa Hart and Irene Sime. Um, we actually collaborated on an immunization presentation that covers COVID, flu, um, RSV, HPV, polio, and some other um, important childhood immunizations as well, and presenting it to seniors and parents. Um, me and Melissa, we presented a um, presentation at the Summit Y last month, and then actually this Friday, we're going to be presenting um, an abbreviated version of that presentation to children um, at the same Y. And um, we've just been collaborating them and we look forward to all the future collaborations that we have together because it's definitely been a fruitful partnership. Thank you. Anyone else? For the Protect Me With Three contest in the chat as well, um, we are still accepting submissions through um, the end of January for that contest. And that is statewide for middle school and high school students to submit a poster or video about um, one of their recommended vaccines. And then we have uh, prizes up to $300 for the winners. 
So I put that flyer in the chat as well. Great, thank you, Emily. One of my favorite contests. Thank you. And just a statement, not not anything too important, but my my daughter who's in elementary school came home very excited the other day that she saw a poster all about vaccines in her hallway of her school. And she's like, and it had the logo from your work, mommy. So she um, she told all her friends about the partnership because of that, of that poster about the vaccine. So nice work. Great, great. Anyone else? Well, I just want to announce that the Bessie May Women and Family Health Center, uh, we're located in East Orange, New Jersey. We have launched about a month ago our Centering Pregnancy um, group and prenatal care sessions. So if you know anyone from this area in the Essex County area that um, would like to join our groups on Saturdays between 10 and 12, please feel free to give them our information, 973-766-1303, and they can ask for our centering coordinator. Her name is Aaliyah, and that's 973-766-1303. Also, in addition to that, we have our Youth Entrepreneur program that's funded through the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives with the state of New Jersey that just began about three weeks ago. So if you have or know of any youth in the um, area between the ages of 15 and 18 years of age, please um, just call that same phone number there, 970 three seven six six thirteen oh three thank you very much Emily for posting that um, and it's a, it's a program that we started in 2015 with the help of the um, Office of Faith-Based Initiatives to help our youth understand the importance of entrepreneurship as well as help them to learn how to write a business plan and to get started with their own business venture at a very young age. So um, just call that number or share that number if you know of anyone. And I want to just mention that this is, we're in our 10th year anniversary here at the Bessie May Women and Family Health Center. So please save the date for April, 2023. We will be celebrating with the gala and we will be sending out an invite and posting it on our social media as well as um, through all of our partnerships. It has been a pleasure serving and working alongside Dr. Schwab this year as vice chair and to work with Emic. And um, I think that we are all working very hard to um, encourage and educate our communities. Again, I wanna thank each and every one of you. And right now I'm gonna turn it back into the hands of Dr. Schwab. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sharp, um, and thanks to all of you. So, uh, are there any last announcements? So if not, I'd like to um, thank every one of you, each and every one of you, for your hard work over the last year as we close out um, this kind of one of a kind 2022. And I'd like to wish to each of you and your families, a very happy and healthy holiday season and all the best for the new year on behalf of myself, Emily, Dr. Sharp, and the, the coalition and the partnership. Um, thanks for all your hard work and we're looking forward to continuing our efforts next year. And so we'll see you at the next meeting. Uh, I guess it's in March. Um, we'll see you at some of the events coming up the date out in January after we um, finalized our, uh, the dates for 2023. Yep. All right, great. So thank you all for attending. Thank you. I will. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.